1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13, we're talking this week about some things that God has put in our life in addition to Himself and His Word in order to bring us on to perfection. Now, God could do everything that needs to be done in our lives by Himself, but He's chosen not to. The working of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, are absolutely, absolutely sufficient But the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have told us in the Word that while they could have been everything that that was, was ever to be used in our lives to bring us on to Christian maturity, He didn't choose to operate that way or work that way. He's put other things in our lives. Last night we saw that He's put pastors and teachers in our lives. And and, uh, prophets and evangelists fall under that heading as well. Uh, Tonight... It's really interesting because what the Lord has put in my life that I need, in addition to God, in addition to the Bible, is every one of you. And what the Lord's put in your life that you need in order to be the Christian God wants you to be is every other Christian. And we often think, uh, we don't don't think of it in those terms, but I want to start with a verse here in 1 Corinthians 13 that bothered me for years. And I would go to commentators and, and they wouldn't have the answer to it. And I'd listen to preachers preach. I'd think, oh good, here it goes. We're going to get the answer. And we never did. And the Bible says in verse 10, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part should be done away. I heard so many interpretations on that verse. I, I heard that when the, when the New Testament came, the Old Testament was done away. Well, that doesn't work. We've still got an Old Testament. And, and when, um, uh, when the, uh, when the New Testament came, then the sign gifts went away, uh, but that, that never, never quite rang the bell. And, and when, um, you know, when Jesus came, then the law was done away, but the law is still going to be used by God in the millennial kingdom and, and other situations. So it just, just, uh, you know how it is when you hear an answer and you say, well, that's okay, but I, I don't think that's it. And then one day, you get the answer and all the bells go off and all the angels sing and you say, that's it, we got it. And so I could tell you in three minutes and we could go home what uh, what that verse is or we could get the whole context and it'd be worth your having driven here. It would be, be worth the effort and also we'll learn some Bible and hopefully get a blessing along the way. So let's pray together. Father, help us tonight. We've got so many, so many uh, concerns and cares and burdens and in our life, in addition to all the distractions and just the day-to-day uh, situations that we have to deal with. We pray, God, you'd help us now in the next few minutes. Just put all that on the back burner and focus in, pay attention to your word this evening, and pray, God, that you'd help me to tell the truth in the way that you want it told. And we thank you for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, First Corinthians 12, verse number 12, the Bible says, For as the body is one... That's what you're living in right now. You're living in a body. He's talking about your physical body. As the body is one and hath many members, head, shoulders, knees, toes, all of that. As, as your body is one, one body hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body. My arm, part of my body. My leg is part of my body. My, my ears, nose, all of that is part of one body. They're not separate entities that just get together once in a while. See? These different parts of my body, that they don't make up my body on Sunday for an hour or in a midweek service. The members of my body are always the members of my body. So also is Christ. You're not in the body of Christ when you come into this building. You're not in the body of Christ when we meet together. You are in the body of Christ round the clock every day of your life since you've been saved. Just like your hand is always part of your body, so those of you who are saved, you're always part of the body of Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So everybody that's saved has the Holy Spirit, and everybody that's saved is part of the body of Christ. That's, you know, there's, you understand, your, your pastor teaches you the Bible. There are groups of people who think that you get saved and then later you get the Holy Spirit. Or you get saved and after you've done a certain set of, uh, performed a certain set of, uh, of deeds, then, then, then maybe you get the Holy Spirit. But that's not what the Bible says. If you're saved, you have the Spirit. Right. Romans 8 9 says, if you don't have the Spirit, you don't have Christ. 
You can't have Jesus Christ and not have the Holy Spirit. Okay, verse 14, for the body. Now we're back to the physical body here. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, and that would freak you out. <laughs> if, if your foot ever starts, starts talking to you, you need to change your meds. <laughs> you're, you're taking the wrong stuff. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Okay, this, this is, uh, the Holy Spirit, he's got a sense of humor. And the Holy Spirit says, just because your ear doesn't want to be part of your body because it wanted to be the eye, not the ear, it doesn't matter. It's still part of your body. And just because your foot says, I don't like the body I'm attached to, I don't want to be part of this body anymore, it doesn't get to opt out. It is a part of your body. Okay, so your ear is right where God put it, your eyes where right where God put that, your foot is right where God put that, and, and, and they didn't have a say in that, they didn't have a choice in that. When God made the body, that's where he put the members of the body. All right, 17. If the whole body were an eye, then that would also be freaky. <laughs> they, they make cartoons and, and movies about stuff like that. You know, the, all of you that had children, who had grown up in the world or grown up unsaved. Maybe, maybe, it meant, I shouldn't say all of you, a lot of you, you, you probably did what I did. I remember walking in that hall and, and, and just it, the days were approaching when our son was going to be born. I remember begging God, don't punish my child for what I did. Lord, if, you, if you're gonna, if there's, if there's any sowing or reaping to be done, I gotta reap it. Don't, don't put it on my kids. And when you walk in there and, and there's hands where they're supposed to be and legs where they're supposed to be and, and the ears are here, not here and the eye, and you just, you say, thank you, God. You've been merciful to me. Cause I'm, I'm telling you, I, I did a lot of things. I know Jesus has forgiven them and they're under the blood, but I don't know what kind of consequences are left for me in my life. And so if you walked in that nursery and the, and the nurse uh, said, the, the doctor said, well, uh, never seen anything like this. And the nurse held up your child as just a great big eye. That would not be a good thing, would it? Would, would, would you admit that that would be a disaster if, if, all that came forth from the womb was a great big eye. Well, I, I hate to get ahead of the message here, but if all that's functioning in this church is a great big pastor, it's a freak. It's a monstrosity. It is not a body. And the Lord didn't say we need a hard working pastor and a bunch of people watching. And we need a, we need a pastor studying the Bible and a bunch of people listening. We need every member of the body in its place doing what it is able to do in addition to the pastor being in his place doing what he is able to do. Amen. And a one man ministry is a freak show. Amen. That's right. Okay. So let's keep going. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And isn't God wise? Uh, why, if he'd put your eyeballs on the bottoms of your feet, you couldn't see much. Right? And, and ears, they're, they're, they're not pretty. In fact, they're not even close to being pretty, but it's kind of nice that they, they're shaped in such a way as to catch the sound when it comes in. Isn't that right? I mean, that God knew what He was doing when He made this body. Uh, my wife tells me I need to quit telling this story, but I, I keep telling it because for some reason it's funny to me. There was, <laughs> this man was in an awful accident, and in the accident it was some kind of a fire thing, and he, it, 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 it burned his ears off. And he, and he got a big insurance settlement and he was going to start a business, but he's real self-conscious about not having any ears. And so he, he started his computer business, but he didn't know anything about computers. Do you know this? If I, okay. And so he's going to start this computer business, but he didn't know anything about computers. So he, he called, he posted the job and this man came in for an interview. He's really smart, hard, energetic young man, knew a lot about computers, but the guy's so self-conscious. He said, son, I got to ask you a question. 
Because if you answer this wrong, I can't hire you. He said, do you notice anything unusual about me? He said, well, you don't have any ears. He said, I, I can't hire you. I, I can't deal with that. And so the next person came in, this young lady. She knew more about computers than that, than that guy did. And she answered all the questions. He's thinking, oh, she's the one. This is great. And he said, well, I just got to ask you, do you notice anything unusual about me? And she said, well, you don't have any ears. He said, I, I can't hire you. I can't deal with that. Well, the third guy came in. He's a genius. He knew more about computers than anybody this man ever met. And they went through the interview and he thought, oh, please, please, I want to hire this guy so badly. And he said, I got to ask you, do you notice anything unusual about me? And he said, well, I noticed you wear contact lenses. And the man said, well, how'd you notice that? He said, well, it's hard to wear glasses. You ain't got no ears. <laughs> I don't know why I think that's funny, but I just, I just always thought that was funny. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. It ends right there. I don't know if you hired him or not. <laughs> Maybe he went to online. <laughs> He's selling stuff on eBay out of his house. I don't know. All right. Anyway, but now, verse 18, Now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now they are many members, yet but one body. Okay, now we understand God didn't write a chapter in the Bible to tell you about your physical body and, and where the different parts go, right? He's talking about the body of Jesus Christ. And he put every saved person in that body by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and like our physical body, he did not give everyone the same ability. He did not give everyone the same talent. He did not give everyone the same gifts. But he put one person to, with, with a great aptitude to work with young people. And he put one person with a great aptitude for music and another person with a great aptitude for finance and another person with great aptitude for... And so, so he took all of our different God-given abilities and all of our God-given at our new birth spiritual gifts and he put us together so that you could do what he can't do, and you can do what she can't do, and you can do what he can't do, and so we can all minister to one another, and we can be as a body what we could never be as individuals. If, if, if everyone here tonight could hear, but no one could see, we would be greatly limited. If everyone here tonight could speak, but none of us could walk, we would be greatly limited. Correct? So, so all of the parts of our body are important, so too every member of the body of Christ is important. In fact, we'll, we'll see what the Lord says about that. Verse 21, the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. What if your eye saw a hamburger? And your hand wouldn't reach for it. You'd stay hungry. Right? What if you had hands that could hold a hamburger, but you didn't have eyes to see where it was? Be tough. So the Lord says the hand and the eye do not exist and do not function independent of one another. They function in union with one another. And each depends upon the other. Now, are you, are you, do you have a really, really good prayer life? Some of you do. I don't. I'm not bragging about that. I'm just, that, that's not my strength. Some of you are very, very sympathetic. Some of you, you when you heard the pastor, his father had gone to be with the Lord today, your heart was grieved and tears came up in your eyes and you, you just, you couldn't wait to be of, of some comfort and some consolation. Others of you aren't that, well, yeah, that's how life is. That's the way it goes. Everybody goes through stuff. We all go through stuff. Okay, that's fine. We're all different, but we all need to be different. But we need to be different together so that each of us can provide the body what the other one cannot. Well, okay, so, so far, everybody seeing what we're talking about here? Okay, look at verse number 22. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. 
Now, your pastor told me this morning, he said, I liked that message last night because it was, it was for the pastor. And, and he said, I, I don't know if I'm going to like the one tonight. Well, you tell him what I said. Preachers tend to cringe when the Lord sends certain needy, clingy, always having a problem, always wanting something, people into the church. We need givers, we need door knockers, we need soul winners, we need Bible teachers. We don't need that. And you know what the Lord said? You do. In fact, you need, look what he said, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. They're necessary. You know what a church needs? A church needs people that teach it how to be patient. A church needs people that teach it how to be gracious. A church needs people... Listen, why would the Lord say the fruit of the Spirit is love? Okay, love, joy, peace. Man, that's great. Yeah. Long-suffering, gentleness, meekness. Why would the Holy Spirit give you long-suffering, gentleness, meekness if there weren't going to be people in the church wearing you out? Now, do I, do I want to manifest the fruits of the Spirit? Do, do you want to manifest the fruits of it? You want to be Spirit-filled, Spirit-led? Well, when we say that, what we mean is, I want to be joyful. I want to be loving. Well, what the Holy Spirit says, I want you to be long-suffering. I want you to be meek. Take wrong without being offended by it. Take wrong without being changed by it. Well, now, how is that going to happen? If the Lord doesn't send some people into our church, they just rub us the wrong way. And don't try to figure out who it is. It might be you. <laughs> I appreciate that everybody didn't look the same direction when I, when I said that. I've had that happen. It's about 30 people turning. Left. How did he know? Verse 23 says, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. They're not. We just think they are. You know there are parts of your body that you haven't thought about maybe in your entire life? Because they're working? Because they're doing what they're supposed to do? I honestly, I, it just the word came to mind. I don't know what a spleen does. I don't know why I have a spleen. But if it quits working about one o'clock in the morning, I will suddenly realize I have one and I wished it was doing what it was supposed to do instead of doing that. Correct? You are not supposed to be noticed. Well, you know, I go to church every week. Nobody notices me. That's good. That means you're working. That means you're doing what you're supposed to do. I, I, I've i got a great wife. I love my wife. i got a wonderful wife. Some, sometimes uh, she didn't get to travel with me much during the school year because we got these good news clubs. We get to teach a Bible in four public schools, Amen. which is a blessing. Go in there to teach a Bible lesson for an hour. But with school's out, she gets to travel with me some. And we'll walk in a church and people say, oh, is this your wife? No, it's a woman I travel with. My wife's at home. What, what kind of question is that? <laughs> of course it's my wife. You are my wife, right? <laughs> anyway, so I got this great wife, but for some reason, she she likes to move furniture around. I don't know why. It's some I mean, the, the rooms. Maybe she just gets bored of the room or something. And I don't pay attention. I don't. I'll be on a trip. I come home and she'll say, "Well." And when she says, well, I know I'm supposed to have noticed something. And I'm, at my, I'm racking my brain. Okay, what, what is it? What am I supposed to notice? And, and she'll, well, look, if there were no drapes, blue drapes, black drapes, white drapes, unless they're on fire, I don't know they're there. <laughs> and so I think just to, to punish me for not noticing when she gets something new in the house, she moves the furniture. And how it is that as, as tall as I am and as wide as I am and as wide as I am, how is it my little toe is what finds the leg of the furniture? 
And these words come to your mind that you thought had been sanctified and removed by the Holy Spirit. And you're, 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 you know what? I'm glad I've got a little toe, but I don't want to ever be aware of having a little toe. Correct? So, so the Lord, He put all these parts in our body to do something. And as long as they're doing what they're supposed to be done, uh, what they're supposed to do, you don't even notice them. You are supposed to get in church and find how you can minister and how you can serve and what you can do and do it noiselessly. Do it painlessly. Do it without applause. Do it without recognition. Do it without having to be asked or driven. Just find your place and do it. And if every one of us does what we can do, it's a great church. Just like if every member of your body is doing what it can do, the way it's supposed to do it, life's great. You know, in Mark 3, there's a man with a withered hand. That's what he's called. The man, the man with a withered hand. Why doesn't the Bible say the man with two good legs, two good knees, great hips, good kidneys, strong liver, heart beating, oh, like a, like a, just like a machine? Because that withered hand got all the attention. That hand not working caused everything else to have troubles and problems. You don't want to be the withered hand in a church. You don't want to be the palsy in the church. You don't want to be the, the, the eye that's gone dark in the church. And, and so he says, there's those uh, members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. <laughs> Ladies. You're a blessing. You are. But we all know fingernails just collect dirt and debris and they're ugly. And so what do you do? You don't rip them out. You file them and you paint them. Conservative colors, bright colors. Teenage girls want each color. <laughs> Some people put great big long ones on them and they put sparkles in them and little jewels and everything else. It's... It's amazing. <laughs> Pay $60, get your nails done, then go get groceries and food stamps. It's kind of a weird society we live in. <laughs> don't, don't get me started on that. In fact, I shouldn't even brought it up. Ears. I, I, I mentioned earlier, ears aren't pretty. Men just got to live with ugly ears. We have, we have to wear short hair and have big ears. That's not fair. Women get to grow their hair long and cover their ears, or if they want to put, uh, pull their hair back and uncover their ears, they get to put decorations in them. They put little gemstones in them. They put feathers in them. They can hang a big hoop there in case a parrot flies by and have, have something to land on. <laughs> Where you been, honey? Shopping for chandeliers? What is that thing? <laughs> anyway, so we take... We take the parts of, I mean, you look in the mirror and say, I'm beautiful except my ears. And so you decorate them. And I'm lovely except my fingernails. And we, so what do we do? Parts of our body that are not up to expectations, we don't abuse them. We give them more attention. Right? Now, let me let me say I, I don't know how your pastor operates. I don't. I've not I've not consulted him. Everybody does it different. If you're a faithful, hardworking, participating, giving member of this church, and the pastor hasn't been to your home and you can't remember when, that is not a bad thing. That's a good thing. It's not a good thing to have to see the cardiologist. If you don't have to see the cardiologist, that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. If you're a brand new Christian, the pastor is going to, or, or someone in this church, they're going to disciple you. They're going to spend time with you. They're going to call you when you're not here. They're going to try and get you involved in things. And once you get running, when he says, turn in your Bible to Malachi and you know where to turn, 
When he's when they're making the announcements about when prayer meeting is and when fellowship is and when visitation is and you can tune it out because you know you're going to be there. Guess what? People are going to quit coming to disciple you. And they're going to quit calling when you're not in church. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But now, if you're one of those who the pastor doesn't come see anymore, and you're not in the discipleship program anymore, and three people don't call when you miss to make sure you haven't backslid, you are now supposed to be paying attention to the members of the body that aren't as strong as you are. You're not supposed to get full attention all your Christian life. You're supposed to grow to the place where you don't need the attention. And now you're supposed to be the one giving the attention. And that's what he said. Now those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these, we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. That's what we just talked about. But God had tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism, division, split, divide in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, I can't speak for anyone in the church but the pastor. I've been pastoring since 1981. That's a long time. And I'll tell you, I will stand in that pulpit on Sunday morning, and I am preaching the Bible, I am teaching the Word of God, I'm trying to bring a, a group of people along in that message and get something across to them, and there's a part of my, a part of my mind, a part of my heart, the whole time I'm preaching... I wonder where they are. They haven't been here in two weeks. In fact, it might be three weeks now. I've got to check on them. I, and, and then you, you preach away and you know, there's a spot. You know that? She, she's here. That's the second week in a row. She's been here without her husband. I hope everything's okay. Maybe he's got work. Uh, maybe his job schedule changed. Maybe, maybe they're having some problems. I better look into that. I'm telling you, every member of the body is important. And when you are not in your place, the whole church suffers. And when you're not doing what you can do, the whole church suffers. It's a fact. It's a fact. God forbid this should ever happen here. But we, we, we know what the Bible teaches about righteousness. We, we know what it teaches. And we know what the Bible teaches about church fellowship. We, we know what it teaches. You, you understand tonight that if, and God forbid, I, I, this, let, let's just say this will never happen here. But it happens other places. Let's suppose one of these young people starts slipping away from the truth of the Word of God, gets cold on the Lord Jesus Christ, gets in the wrong relationship, and they end up an unmarried couple of young people with a baby on the way. Only one teen in the entire church has messed up their life. And the entire church suffers because of it. We lose our joy. We lose our focus on Jesus Christ. We lose our unity as everyone decides how it should be handled and shouldn't be handled. And, and so, I, I know that's a drastic example, but I'm telling you, if one part of your physical body stops working, it, it dramatically affects your entire body. And if one member of the body of Christ gets out of the way and stops serving as they ought and living as they ought, every one of us is affected by it. Why, why am I saying this? You can't say you don't matter to your church. You can't say I can stay home and it won't matter. I can drop out and it won't matter. I can quit participating and it won't matter. It matters. It matters. If you don't believe that, just go home and cut off one of your fingers. So, oh, I'm, no, no, I would never do that. Well, why would you cut off a member of the body of Christ from the fellowship of God's people? You could get by with nine fingers, but why would you want to? Church could get by with, if we lost one family, we could keep going, but we don't want to. Everybody matters. All right, so verse number 27. Now, ye are the body of Christ. And members in particular. And God has set some in the church. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? 
This is this participation time. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? Yes. Do, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> no. Do all infer, interpret? No. No. Look what he just said. If all of these gifts are necessary, and no one has all of them, then I don't have the one that you have, so I need you. And you don't have the one that I have, so you need me. And we've both got the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit said we need each other. I need what the Holy Spirit can minister through you, and you need what the Holy Spirit can minister through me, and so we can't form cliques, we can't have little groups that we hang out with and others that we don't talk to. We all need we all. Bad grammar, good Bible. 31, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. Every member doing what it can for the body, and yet there's something better than that. Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Your King James Bible is a fascinating book. Husbands, love your wives. Right? Doesn't say saved husbands, love you. husbands, wives. Husbands supposed to love his wife. Uh, the younger women, uh, the age of women teach younger women to, young, to love their husbands. Didn't say if they're saved. Just, look, a mother can love a child. A wife can love a husband. A husband can love a wife. A grandparent can love a grandchild. Charity in your King James Bible is, the modern versions change it to love. Every time charity appears in the Bible, it is love between saved people only. Love, we're to love our neighbor as ourself. We're to have fervent charity among ourselves. It's different. Now, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth. God doesn't have to teach me to love the members of my physical body. That's just instinctive. That, that just comes naturally. You know, Think about this. So, some kid's playing in the yard. He throws a rock, and the rock hits somebody. You know that because you heard him yell. How do you know where it hit him? They immediately grab the place it hurts. Isn't that right? Oh, my. You don't have to say, is it your heart? Because we grab the place that hurts. It's instinctive. But you know what the Lord said? Saved people don't have that instinct for the body of Christ. But if I know the entire Bible inside and out, and when this man hurts, I don't instinctively reach out to help him. My knowledge is not enough. If I've got all these great spiritual abilities and I can, I can preach the Word of God and I can teach a Sunday school class and this family's hurting and this family's having trouble and I don't instinctively reach out to be of help to them, i got some growing to do. So I can have ability, but ability with charity is even better. Because my ability now is not self-centered but it is automatically, it is instinctively, it is immediately directed toward others. Now that's Christ-like. Satan has ability, but it's all for himself. Christ has <laughs> all power, but it's directed toward others. See? And so charity is taking all of my God-given natural ability and all my God-given spiritual ability and learning to use it not for myself but for others. How's it described? Look at, look at the next verse. 13.4 Charity suffereth long and is kind. <laughs> See, it's more than just putting up with it. It's putting up with it and still being kind. 
See that? Uh, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Now here's what I was taught. New Testament's complete, the sign gifts go out. Sounds good, until you read the context. Look at the context of what we're reading. Charity doesn't fail. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now watch this. Go back to verse 4. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Look back verse number 5. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Let, let's just say, God forbid. Let's say there's a married couple here tonight. We'll, we'll, just, it's, we'll, we'll use this couple right here. This married couple right here, this man has, has backslidden on God and he is doing some terrible, terrible things he should not be doing. He still knows every verse in the Bible about husbands and wives. But his knowledge has failed. See? He, he still knows how a husband is supposed to treat a wife. But his understanding of the scriptures is not enough because he is lacking charity in his heart. See that? Now, she gets bitter because of what he's been doing. And she's, well, if he's going to live like that, then I'm just going to walk out of church. I'm going to quit on God if God don't answer my prayers and straighten him out. And she knows everything the Bible says about a wife, about long-suffering, about trusting God through troubles and trials, but her knowledge has failed. They both still got the spiritual gifts God gave them when they got saved, but, but unless they have charity toward each other, they can walk right out of the church and ruin their marriage and know as much about the Bible as at the, in the divorce court as they did when they were in the Sunday school. See what the Lord said? There will come a point in time in your life when you've got to have more than facts in your head. And you've got to have more than ability with your hand. You've got to have a heart filled with God's charity. Or everything else is going to fall apart. You know, we've all heard horror stories about preachers doing terrible things while standing in the pulpit and preaching Sunday after Sunday. So how can they do that? Because they've got knowledge. They've got spiritual gifts. Well, then how can they bring such ruin upon their families and upon the, co the cause of Jesus Christ, upon the testimony of the gospel? Because they didn't have charity. It's greater than gifts and ability because it will keep you doing right, not just knowing right. Let me, let me illustrate. I am, I guess right now I'm about, I'm about 1100 miles away from home. I don't need a single commandment in the Old Testament or the New to be true to my wife while I'm away. Because I love her. And if I didn't love her, I, God could have written 50 commandments instead of 20 about husbands being faithful to their wives and it wouldn't matter. You understand what we're saying? Your children, listen, you can have all the right rules in place and as soon as you leave to go to the store, those children will break every one of them and straighten up as soon as you get back because they know what they're supposed to do and they know how to do it. But the day you leave for that store and those children say, I'm not going to break the rules because it would make mom unhappy. See what we're after? Charity is greater than knowledge. Charity is greater than ability. Okay? We, everybody see that? All right, let's keep reading. And so the Bible says, verse number 9, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Hey, we're almost ready to know what those verses mean. 
Verse 9, part. Verse 9, part. Verse 10, part. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So what are we after? We're after a part with ability and a part with gifts that is vanishing away because it's childish. And what's taking its place is a maturity that is greater than the part. Hmm. Where have we read that before? Go back to chapter 12. Go back to chapter 12. Verse 23, Our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. God tempered the body together, having given more abundant unto that part which lacked. Now watch this. See this right here? This eye? It's a part. And it's got things it can do that no other parts can do. But if I rip it out of my head and set it on that chair, it's useless. Look at this ear. It's a part. It can do things that no other part can do. But if I rip it out of my head and put it on that chair, it's useless. Look at that hand. It's a part. It can do things no other part can do. But if I, if I tear it off my arm and put it on that chair, it's useless. But when the eye says, never mind, I don't even want you to think about the eye. I'll just do what I do so you can walk and, and enjoy life. And the ear says, forget it. You don't even have to think about me being an ear. I'll just listen and say. When all the parts work anonymously and all the parts work in unison, then the body as a whole is blessed and functions the way it's supposed to. The immature, I'm not being critical, it's just a fact. The immature, the baby Christian, says, what's in it for me? What's in the service for me? Do you have the kind of music I like? Is the sermon the length I like? Is the temperature in the building what I like? Do you have things for young people that my children will like? We we get that. If you're a brand new Christian, we get that. We need you to come and do what you can do and learn and participate and give and grow. But one day, one day, the Lord wants to bring you to the place where you don't say, what do you got for me? Where you say, what can I do to help? What can I do to serve? Where can I fit in and be a blessing? It's not about me anymore. Now, you know what that'll do? That'll make church great every time you come. Your pastor has some messages. I I, I saw on the table he's been preaching some messages on the family. When the pastor preaches on husbands, do you realize how many people that excludes? You can't come to church on the day the pastor is preaching on husbands and all of you say, man, that was was just for me. That that hit me right here in the heart. Because you're not one. Uh, Next week, we're going to talk about raising children. Well, like you grandparents need to hear that. (laughs) Like like these little boys. uh, What what, what am I saying? There's a lot of sermons that you're not going to get anything out of. They're not for you. How rarely is the congregational selection going to be one of your favorite songs? How rarely will the choir sing the song you just wanted to hear? Not very often. But if every time you came to church, you came to be a blessing to somebody else and a help to somebody else, there would never be a time you came to church that it wasn't a joy to be there because you can always give something to somebody. You can't always get something. You can always give something. And so the Lord said, better than being a member of the body is being a member that serves others. And better than having spiritual gifts is using those gifts for others. And better than having knowledge of the Bible is using that knowledge to help others. Now let's see if we're right. Could we possibly find 
a cross-reference that says the same things we just read. Keep your finger right there. Come to Ephesians 4, where we were last night. So I was a child, but I want to go on to perfection. And, and I've, I, I need others. I need others. Not just Jesus. Not just the Holy Spirit. I need other Christians to get me to this maturity. Let's see if we can find it. Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man when that which is perfect is come. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we, be, that we henceforth be no more children... That's just what you read in chapter 13, 1 Corinthians. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by sleight of men, cunning craft, and swore by their lie, and wait to see. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure, watch, of every Part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I love God. That doesn't help you. I love me. That doesn't help anybody. But if I love you, see, my Part doesn't matter. The whole matters. And if you, if you will use your part to help me, and I'll use my part to help you, we can all grow up and be perfect Christians. But we can't be perfect Christians without each other. Because I don't have everything I need and you don't have everything you need. Now, let's, let, I'm going to say one last thing, and then we're going to read one last proof of what we're talking about. Come back to 1 Corinthians. Who's the head of the body? It's Christ. Christ, the head of the body, right? So, you, you've been sitting here tonight, and, and this, it's an amazing thing. Your hands turn the pages in the Bible at the direction of your head. Your eyes look at the words in the Bible, but they send what they see to your head. And your head sends it to your comprehension. And, and what you hear, everything that every part of this body does is governed by and runs through the head. How about that? So everything, if each, if everything each of us did was done Directed toward and in, un in, in communion with and in, in cooperation with the head of the body, Jesus Christ. Then, see, there's no palsy. There's no, uh, there's no uh, constriction of the blood flow. There's no, everything works if it does what the, what the head tells it to do. And the advantage the body of Christ has over the human body, our head never goes bad. Never goes bad. Okay, 1 Corinthians, look at 14.1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. That's good. But rather that you may prophesy. Now, he said at the end of chapter uh, 12 to covet earnestly the best gifts. Now he's saying rather you may prophesy. Why is prophecy the desired gift? Watch. For he that speaketh an unknown tongue speaketh unto men. Uh, not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the Spirit he speaketh mystery. So it's a good thing to speak in a tongue, because it edifies you. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men, to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Okay, so here's two gifts. One edifies me, the other benefits everybody else. Verse 19, in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. 
Now, we, we always look at that when we're teaching on tongues. Let's, let's look at it tonight in its context. To do something for others is thousands and thousands and thousands of times better than to do something for yourself. Tongues edify me. Fine. Prophecy edifies everyone else. I'd rather speak five words that edify you than 10,000 words that edify me. So says the Holy Spirit. Now, if you just got saved, read your Bible. Say your prayers. Come to church and learn what you can. Get a blessing out of everything that happens here. But if you've been saved any length of time, it's time for you to grow up. Everything is not about you. There's no blessing there. Not, not once you get out of the, out of the nursery. No blessing for you there. The blessing is to come here and say, what can I do for them? What can I do for them? What can I do for them? The happiest people in any church are the people who have no time left on their schedule and volunteer for the next new ministry. The more you can do for others and the less you can do for yourself, the more you're going to enjoy this thing. I need what God gave you because he didn't give it to me. You need what God gave me because he didn't give it to you. And so if we isolate ourselves or live unto ourselves, we can never get where God wants us to go because we don't have all the tools. But as we work together, fellowship together, minister one to another, we grow up and become Christ-like. And it's wonderful. It is. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you for letting us be a part of your body. We don't want to diminish that in any way. But Lord, we ask and pray that you'd help us to see beyond our part. And Lord, to be just as excited about the whole body as we are a little place in it. Have your way at the, in the uh, invitation time and the close of the service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.